All right, everybody, welcome back to the Glass Less Traveled. My name is Mike Verivi. I am a certified bourbon steward and founder of the Fox Valley Whiskey Society. We're going to explore and introduce you to America's craft distilleries, microbreweries, industry insiders, and professional imbibers to give you the inside scoop on the things you need to be drinking. Uh, don't forget to click like and subscribe to stay up to date on the latest live interviews with your favorite distilleries, breweries, and influencers. You can also uh, take us on the go via your favorite podcast platform and listen to us at the Glass Less Traveled. Uh, tonight, we are leaving America. We are talking with Don Hurst, brand ambassador for Rooster Beers in Vietnam. Uh, and because this is such a unique episode, we decided to head to social media and ask the craft beer community what they would like to know about the craft beer scene in Vietnam. So tonight, we've got a few questions from the folks uh, from all over the Chicagoland area that want to know more about Rooster Beers. Uh, but first, I want to thank Don for joining us uh, tonight. Uh, it is actually 7 o'clock in the morning on Thursday in Vietnam. So uh don before we get started i'm gonna i'm gonna cheers you here to uh to a 7 a.m beer uh yeah. no better time, no better time to get drinking no better time to get drinking you don't know um, what's in there yeah <laughs> there could be coffee in there um <laughs> tell us about rooster beer how they got started what styles of beer they make how you yeah. got hooked up yeah. with them etc all right so rooster started uh back in 2015 uh out here in vietnam <laughs> and kind of like the, the the whole big bang of craft beer happened uh, around that time as well. So you had this place called, I'll give you a little history of the craft beer scene out here. So there was this uh, Chicago native, Mark Gustafson, and this guy, Tim Scott from Australia, who opened up this restaurant called Quan Ut Ut, which kind of means like, uh, Ut Ut is the noise that pigs make out here, you know, like that. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's an American style barbecue. And... Mark started making the barbecue and started making his own home brews. And at the same time, you had Platinum Brewery, Fuzzy Logic, and Pastor Street kind of, you know, starting to, you know, make some beers and, and sell them around town. And then that's when our CEO and founder, Mike, ran into Mark and Tim at Utu. And he was like, holy shit, you guys are making beer? This is awesome. I'm going to do it. So Mike went and bought equipment and... Uh, you know, we all drive, majority of us drive scooters out here. You know, what we would call back home in America. We, you know, we call them bikes out here, but scooters. So he bought um, like a 200 liter or, or 500 liter uh, uh, fermenter and some other equipment, put it strapped on the back of his scooter and drove it out to the countryside. And the countryside is where in Konya, which a lot of foreigners will call Monkey Island. Excuse me. And, um, they had a house out there. And at the same time, Mike was like, fuck it, I'm gonna try, I'm gonna start brewing some beer, you know? And so he started making it and then started selling it to some of his friends, then went to restaurants, started selling some Mark and Tim. And next thing you know, he's like, okay, well, I wanna start doing this more and more and more. And then it started just growing and growing and growing and growing. Yeah. And, um, you know, the, the original, the whole brewing facility was in this kind of like straw hut uh, attached yeah. to the side of the house. Uh, originally, it was some neighbor that had all his cars in there. And we bought, or Mike and his wife, Mai, bought it. And he started turning it into a brewery, you know. And this was, uh, at this same time, you know, then we're seeing other breweries pop up. Now you got Rooster Beers, uh, Pastor Street, Fuzzy Logic, uh, uh, Platinum, Black, Tay Tay. Uh, and a couple of others. Sorry, I forgot. But uh, that was like the first wave. So the craft beer scene is actually, I mean, I think a lot of people would be surprised to know that there's actually a, a, quite a big scene out there. Yeah, it's, I still believe it's kind of still in the infancy years uh, sure. because we're only going on like five, six years now of craft. And so when that first wave happened, uh, Tim, Tim and Mark are kind of like the godfathers of the craft beer scene. Because what happened next is that, you know, yeah, people started selling some of the beers at the barbecue restaurant, but then they're like, oh, shit, there's a market for this. And let's open up uh, a craft beer bar. So in District 2, everything is like in districts out here. Yeah. Uh, District 2, they uh, opened up a restaurant called Bia Craft. B-I-A, that's beer in Vietnamese, uh, craft. So Bia Craft. And it's pretty much how a lot of people say craft beer, Bia Craft out here. You know, or, sure. uh, or Bia Tui, which is uh, like fresh beer. And um, they opened up Beer Craft, and that gave an outlet for all the breweries to, to, to sell their beer at. And it was so small. It was 
almost like as big as my apartment. It was pretty small compared to regular restaurant size, you know? And um, yeah. so they, they opened that up and then we started seeing more breweries. And then when I moved out here at the end of 2016, that's when we saw the second wave of breweries and some breweries from Hanoi opening up as well too. So it's, uh, and it's still growing. It's crazy. It's uh, it, it's really interesting. So um, you and I were, were we we spoke a little bit before we spoke about a half hour before this. Um, it's actually really interesting how you and I got connected. Um, so yeah. Don, you're actually from you're from Lombard, uh, Illinois. Um, so a lot of VP Park. Yeah. Park. Um, so a lot of a lot of the Chicago craft beer guys that are watching tonight, or will listen to the podcast later, or will watch a video yeah. later, um, you know, might be familiar with you. You actually went to school with my wife, uh, yeah. and that's how that's how uh, that's how you and I got connected. Um, yeah. So I just it was it's really it's a really kind of interesting uh, interesting story. And I shot you a message one night, and I was like, "Hey, we need to talk about Vietnamese beer. Like, I do this thing about craft beer and craft, you know, craft distilleries. Yeah. You got to be on it. I got to talk to yeah, you." Yeah, and it. and I was I was totally uh, amped about it. You know, I was like, "Fuck yeah, this is gonna be awesome." I was uh, awesome. I was surprised to learn through doing all the research that there are as many. As, as many breweries as I found. I mean, you just Google, you know, craft beer in Vietnam and you get a pretty, mm -hmm. you know, a pretty substantial list. It was yeah, actually kind of, kind of yeah, surprising. Yeah, um, the, uh, we get people that come to Vietnam and they, uh, uh, um, they make their own little craft beer trails, I guess you would yeah. say. Yeah. They make their little scavenger hunts of all the different craft breweries. You know, I try to tell them, I'm like, oh yeah, go check out this brew. And they're like, yeah, it's on the list. I'm like, oh, <laughs> you have a okay. list? <laughs> yeah. I was like, you, Hey, this is good. I like that. I like where this is going. So, uh, so we we took some questions a couple weeks ago. I posed a question on the uh, uh, Chicago Chicago Land Craft Beer Group or whatever. A couple of them on Facebook, uh, just to see if anybody would be interested in kind of giving me some feedback or, or giving me some questions, something that they would like to know. Um, yeah. Please, if anybody watching tonight does have any questions for Don, uh, whether it be about the craft beer scene in Vietnam or just you know Vietnam in general. Um, if you're watching on uh, Facebook, if you're watching on uh, on YouTube Live, you can comment. It will pop up right here on the screen, so we can uh, uh, so we can uh, view everything and, and answer the questions for you. Um, but Dale Lewis uh, wants to know: as an American in Vietnam, working at a brewery, I'm sure you have a unique perspective on the beer culture. In the United States, we have a love affair with beer, and more specifically, with craft beer. Currently, there are over 8,000 craft breweries in the United States alone offering styles like milkshake IPAs, pastry stouts, stouts, fruit-heavy sours, and dozens of other varieties and styles. Tell us how Vietnam differs from the U.S. when it comes to the beer culture, and more specifically, how far behind is Vietnam from the United States when it comes to the craft beer industry? Wow. Yeah, all right. There, there's a lot to unload on that one with the drinking. Yeah. Right there. So, uh, like Vietnam was in the top three uh, beer consumption uh, in all of Asia. It's crazy. So, you know, like the drinking culture out here is alive and well. People love to drink. But the thing is, is that it's mainly mass produced lagers, you know. Sure. So, out here, the number one lager, you know, back home in the States, what, like our lagers are uh, Miller Light and Bud Light. So sure. everyone's doing that stuff. Out here, you got Tiger. You get Budweiser too, but Tiger, Heineken, Budweiser, uh, Who Garden is actually pretty popular. But you get all these beers, and a lot of the time, people are drinking them with ice, um, the because the beer's warm, and it's also really hot out here in Saigon. So people yeah. just they just drink it with ice, you know. And um, so the drinking culture definitely. Um, I'd say a little bit more hectic than, than back home in the States when it comes to drinking. Uh, they have designated sinks out here for when you go out drinking with your friends that if you need to, you go to that sink and you do your business, then you go to the regular sink, wash your hands, wash your mouth, and go back to your friends and family and continue to drink. That should be adopted here in the United States. <laughs> I remember the first that time I saw that. I told the I told the one owner I was like Chang I was like there's somebody threw up in your sink in the bathroom he's like no it's okay that's what that's for I was like oh I was like oh wow I was like this is pretty cool and um, yeah so that kind of set the pace right away um, but then when it comes to the craft beer up uh, scene out here it's still to the local to the regular person you know it's still kind of unheard of you know it's uh, 
it's a new concept to a lot of people. So where we live, right across the river where we live, I mean, it's, it's you know, not that, it's not that well, uh, uh, I don't know, I don't know what the right word for it is, but they don't, they don't really know what craft beer is. You know, all they know is Tiger. And if you, and it's a little bit more expensive than the mass produced lager, it's, sure. it's hard for a lot of the people to jump on board. Why would I pay 50,000, 50K Vietnamese dong is the equivalent to about uh, $2 US, okay? okay? So why would I pay $2 US for a craft beer, which to us, we're like, holy shit, that's amazing, you yeah. know? But out here, they're like, I can spend half of that and get a bottle. I can get sure. two bottles for the price of that. You know, so trying to break that market and get the craft beer into there is really hard. So the the love affair that people have back home in the States with craft isn't there quite, uh, isn't out here yet. Not yet, at least. So, and that's something that Rooster and a few other breweries out here are trying to do. Is to make you, guys, so you guys are work, working on it to try to get more, more people into the craft scene. Yeah, um, yeah. Look, looking at Rooster's portfolio, we see very traditional si styles of beer that you would mm -hmm. find pretty much anywhere around the globe. Styles like Pilsner, IPA, Hefeweizen, etc., are very kind of old traditional beers. Is yeah. this traditional take on beer indicative of what the consumer prefers in Vietnam? Yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, um, there's so a little bit of the history with the beer in Vietnam. They're back in the day, and this is what uh, Mike's wife, Mai, she's like my adopted Vietnamese mother. You know, she, she told me about back in the day in Vietnam is that you had yellow and you had dark beer. You had these two styles of beer. And everyone could drink the yellow beer because it was affordable. And then people with a little bit more money, they could afford the dark beer. So out here, there's, it's always been yellow and dark. And sure. I guess uh, the original craft was all the Czech and German style uh, and yeah. Belgian style breweries out here, you know, um, and that's what they were making. They were just making uh, just regular, easy drinking ales uh, and some dunkles and, have, and whatnot. So, you know, is it a representation of what's going on out here? Yeah, totally. Because people out here, especially the locals, they're, the locals in general, that Rooster, I speak for, for Rooster. A lot of the other breweries, they follow the trends in America, but we don't. So if I introduce one of my local friends to Hazy IPA and it, or a Milkshake IPA, they're like, what? What is this? What's an IPA to begin with? You know, they don't, right. they don't know what, what's really going on. Um, so, but when you show them the blonde ale or the Pilsner, they're like, bang, bang, which is yellow. And they're like, okay, yeah. I already know where this is going. And then they drink the Pilsner. They're like, oh, I've had something like this before. Or this is, it's, yeah. it's not offensive. It's easy drinking. And that's what we're aiming for, you know? So um, I think the craziest uh, style of beer that we make uh, just for intensity purposes is the double IPA, you know? Um, it's 9.2%. But oh, wow, okay. a lot, yeah, there's, there's, there's a few people that, there's a few of my local friends that love to drink it, but not that much. And I'm like, it's too strong. I'm like, oh, yeah, I know, <laughs> you know? But yeah, definitely, we make those traditional styles because out here it's it's easier for the local person to, to, to grasp it, you know? Yeah. Now, do you find that those styles like the milkshake IPA, the pastry stout, the hazy IPAs, things like that, do you find other breweries or do you find those styles kind of <laughs> starting to like take hold the way they did here in the States? Like, you know, you said that the craft beer industry is kind of still in a, in its infancy there in, in Vietnam, yeah. but are you starting to see like a trend one way or another, or is it still kind of like, this is what I know. This is what I like. This is what I'm sticking with. So you'll see, you'll see trends. I remember for six months, IPAs with the locals were just crazy. We were selling IPA nonstop. A lot of the breweries were selling IPAs, you know? And then uh, when it comes to, to like the hazy IPAs, we don't really have, Pastry stouts? I don't really know if anyone's doing a pastry stout out here. Yeah, I don't think so. But when it comes to like the milkshakes and the hazy IPAs, you do get that out here. So in Vietnam, you have so many different breweries, the the, the spectrum of, of beers out here. You got Rooster and Platinum and like Tay Tay that make 
easy drinking classic beers and sure. for like the masses. And then you got you got breweries like Heart of Darkness and Turtle Lake that are making those hazy IPAs and those milkshake IPAs. And I'll tell you what, the foreigners right away were like, fuck yeah, this is amazing. You know, this is um, <laughs> all the rage I read back home. I want to try it. I'm not going anywhere anytime soon. So let's do this. Um, and yeah, the locals try it. They dig it, you know, but it's 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 more of those one and done type of things. You know, sure. a lot of those, a lot of those beers. It's not to to go back to the earlier question. You know, how they drinking so much out here? You can't drink 15, 12, yeah. 10 AZ IPAs and pastries. Yeah, that's true. You know, so I I love those. I'll have one. You know, one of my one of my favorite uh, uh, IPAs out here is the Kurtz and Sane by Heart of Darkness, but it's like a ninety IBU or hundred IBU, some crazy insane. So I just, I have one of them. I can't have too many, you know, I yeah. know a few people that can drink that all night long, but, you know, but it's, it's sometimes it's just too much. So there's not, you don't really see that those trends out here. Yeah. You know? You'll see, you'll see a handful of the breweries doing it, but at their own tap rooms. Right. Uh, or at Beer Craft, because Beer Craft has multiple locations. So they'll send it to this one, they'll send it to that one. Sure. And, you know, um, you, you can try it there. Yeah, and we got we got a handful of imports too. I forgot about that. There was this company. Yeah, what 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 are you guys? So we'll we'll talk about a little bit. Um, like, what one of the questions is, you know, like you know what it's what rooster is comparable to. But I'm I'm really kind of curious as to what you guys have in Vietnam, um, that we also have here, or what we have here that you guys also have okay. in Vietnam. All right, so there was this company um, called Beervana. Um, they're they're not really doing too much after COVID. They they, they kind of hurt a little bit during that. Uh, I hope they come back because they were bringing in uh, one of my favorites is uh, Dead Guy. I got the Dead Guy uh, tattoo. Oh yeah, Dead Guy. Yeah. Uh, Dead guy yeah. You know, yeah. So we got you know, Birvana was importing a lot uh, before Beer Birvana Beercraft was importing a few different ones. You know, I saw Dead Guy Ale and I was like, fuck yeah, this is amazing. Uh, but Birvana they bring in Stone, Anderson Valley, Rogue. Uh, 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 founders. Uh, I bought a Goose Island yesterday uh, at three one two over really? the uh, yeah this uh, this place called the Nam Market. I was just there with our brewer and uh, we're getting some lunch and we walked by and I was like oh shit three one two I was like Chicago. Chicago. <laughs> I was like this is great yeah. So my girlfriend and her family tried it last night. They're like this tastes really good. I was like yes yeah, <laughs> yes it does. Um, but yeah, there's so many breweries from the states are out here and then there's a lot of um, other breweries that are imported there's this really cool place called rehab station uh sun and chang the owners over there they import crazy amounts of like uh trappist beers you know yeah, uh, yeah all this crazy stuff they got a they got a bottle there they got uh, a couple of bottles of beer that cost uh like two and a half million vietnamese dong which is about like a hundred dollars us yeah. For one for one just bottle yeah. of beer. You know, they get the crazy cool stuff, man. It's really nice. You had uh you had mentioned when 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 we had spoke one of these big global brands, um, like Corona, uh, that yeah. has quite a presence there in Vietnam. How have the large brands like these impacted the local craft beer scene? So when it comes to the big brands, like Corona is definitely out here, don't get me wrong, but it's not like huge. The huge ones would be Tiger, Heineken, and, and Budweiser. And what they do a lot of the time is you'll see huge Tiger signs and they they pay bars, they pay local bars X amount of money to, to, to carry their POSM, to carry their beers, to, to, to do promotions. And, you know, then to us, the little guys, you know, we're still little. We may be big for what we do, but we're still small on the grand scale right. of things. And... <clears throat> It's hard for us because then I go into a bar and I try to sell them our product. And sometimes they're like, how much money are you going to give me? And I'm like, ah, I can give you beer and you can make money from that. <laughs> you know, I'll give you, I'll give yeah. you like a, a case or a keg for, for free and we do a promotion. You can have some fun with it, you know, but a lot of the time <laughs> Tiger, Tiger or Heineken or just any big beer brand out here, they will somehow try to block other companies from coming in and only carrying their own stuff. And, um, you know, at times, 
I just like being in the same fridge with Heineken, <laughs> you know, just having yeah, that, yeah. that product placement there, you know, trying to get the name yeah. out there and showing it around. But you'll everywhere out here, Tiger beer. Do you, have you ever heard of Tiger? I've never heard of Tiger, no. All right, so Tiger is a Singaporean, I believe it started in Singapore. Someone can correct me if I'm wrong. But uh, in Singapore, Tiger started, and it is the most mass-produced uh, like lager out here. Uh, I believe Heineken owns them now. And they're they're just everywhere. Uh, when we go to little quans where we sit on stools that are like this big, uh, <laughs> the little tiny stools. <laughs> yeah, the little tiny stools, and we and we want to order some beer. A majority of the time, it's Tiger, and they cost about fifty cents to a dollar a bottle. To yeah. and okay, fuck it, let's get drunk, you know. And then they they bring you a case of warm beer. They set it next to you on the bottom of your table. Then they'll bring you a bucket of ice. And you just grab the tongs, you put some ice in your cup, and you pour your warm beer over and you start drinking it. And it's, you know, tigers everywhere. When I went yeah. back home uh, last year for my friend's uh, wedding, uh, we went to World of Beer, I think it, what yeah. it is. Uh, yeah. World of Beer. And on um, everything's craft. And then on the Southeast Asia section, it was all these mass produced lagers. And I was like, bro, I was like, what are you doing? I was like, this isn't craft beer. <laughs> And he's like, what do you mean? And I was like, these are all mass-produced lagers. And I was like, this is not craft at all. And he's like, well, out here. And I was like, I I get that concept, but totally yeah. wrong. If this dude is watching, like, yo, I'll hook you up with a case of Brewster. You know, let's put some real Vietnamese craft beer in there. And uh, <laughs> and uh, I told him, I was like, look, go grab me some ice and a, and a glass and a warm tiger. And he's like, what the fuck is wrong with you? And I was like, just, just do it. Right? And uh, – then I'm like, this is how we do this is how we do in Vietnam. So I grab the glass, put some ice in it, and people are looking at me like, is this man really putting ice in his beer right now? <laughs> I'm like, yeah. I'm like, yeah. And then I pour the warm beer over the ice, and I, I go, uh, you know, how we say cheers in, Viet in Vietnam is mot hai ba yo, which is one, two, three cheers. You know, so I'm like yeah. mot hai ba yo, and everyone's like, what is this dude doing? <laughs> You know who is the person? Yeah. <laughs> and people ask him like, "This is how we, this is how we really drink Tiger in in, in Vietnam." You know, uh, and it's not craft. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you see Tiger everywhere out here. Everywhere yeah. you go, Tiger and, and Budweiser and Heineken. So, and you know what? Heineken tastes really different. Everything tastes different out over here. Even the sauce at McDonald's tastes different. You know, um, it's. <laughs> Regarding uh, regarding kind of like the you know the flavor and the and the taste out there, um, obviously us here in the states uh, likely will not get to try anything from Rooster unless we make a trip uh, to one of the Southeast Asian countries you distribute to, or unless that is the closest representation available to us that would be comparable in flavor to Rooster beers. Like, what could uh, we get here that yeah. you would be like, that's pretty close. It's hard, man. You know, uh, not being back for almost four years now, a lot has changed. Like I remember yeah. when you when you couldn't even get Revolution, uh, like Antihero in Indiana. You know, you had a you had a wait on a on a waiting list. Oh, there it is for Gumball Head. For Gumball Head. <laughs> you know, I wait like two weeks to get a six pack of it. Uh, I used to pay our, our our beer supplier two times the value of a six pack of Zombie Dust. You know, it like fell off the truck type of thing and paid him like $30 for a six pack, you know. So a lot is a lot has definitely changed in some of the styles and, and tastes. And, you know, you have to really go back maybe like 10 to 20 years uh, uh, in the craft beer scene back home in the States to kind of get a taste of what we're going for. Sure. You know, so ex like comparable taste it's hard for me to say but styles like take la unita's ipa for instance la unita's ipa just pure classic straight to the point ipa our ipa is west coast style ipa straight easy clean uh, uh medium about like uh what is it like 50 40 yeah like 52 ibus in the ipa so it's not it's not overbearing you know um Sure. So that, you know, I would say drink a Lagunitas IPA, not for the taste, but for the style. And that's what we're going for when it comes to Rooster IPA. Um, the Pilsner, sure. which is my personal favorite. I fucking love our Pilsner. It took our brewer, Doug, <laughs> uh, like six to eight months to dial it in the right way. So if you want 
something that would be comparable to our taste of Pilsner, go try a traditional style Czech Pilsner that uses sauce hops. And that's what we're yeah. doing over here. You know, okay. uh, the, uh, the, the double IPA and the blonde ale that we make is kind of hard because those were originals. Those, the blonde ale Mike made when he first started Rooster. It's his own recipe. You know, since then, our brewer, Doug, who has 28 years of brewing experience, I want to say, and I'm pretty sure we have the most experienced brewer in Vietnam when it comes to how many years, you know, um, and I'm not trying to say the other brewers don't know what they're doing. Sean from East West, he's a great fucking brewer. He's amazing, you know, and, um, and so is Dwayne from Heart of Darkness. But um, Doug, he's got 28 years of brewing experience. He's been all around the world. It's crazy. It's insane. You know, sometimes I'll just message him questions when I'm bored. You know, I'll be like, why does beer bubble? You know, and, <laughs> you know, and he'll, he'll give me the, he'll give me the exact scientific answer, <laughs> brewing answer of why beer bubbles, you know? And <laughs> um, uh, um, yeah, man. So, but when it comes to, to trying beers back home in the States that taste like us, it's, it's kind of hard for me to say. You know, I guess when I come back next year, I'll uh, I'll have to bring enough beer with me too. Because last year when I came back, I brought I don't know like a twenty four pack, and it was gone in two somebody, days. Somebody, uh, somebody, and you commented on it by the way today on the on the Chicago yeah. Craft Beer Group. Uh, somebody yeah. had mentioned that by the way, and apparently they're yeah. still holding a grudge. I know. <laughs> I was like, sorry, dude. Was hey, like, man. So there's only yeah. there's only so much to go around. I think it is possible to send beer back home to the states it's just going to cost a fortune so if yeah. you guys want to pay the shipping fees yeah. i got you and well, I'll, I'll, throw, I'll throw in some hats and some shirts for you guys too by right, the time worry. you get it it's all i mean it's all like shaken up and it's like yeah, yeah. don't open it for like at least a <laughs> yeah. day you know? um <laughs> This uh, this global pandemic we're facing has certainly hurt the craft beer industry here in the United States. The American Brewers Association has stated that as much as 50% of the craft breweries could shutter within the next four to six months if things don't change soon. Uh, many have been able to weather the storm by offering curbside pickup online sales and introducing new social platforms as a way to connect with their prime consumer. How has yeah. Vietnam been affected by COVID-19, specifically when it comes to the craft beer industry? Because here, okay. it's, it's basically shut everything down. Yeah. So I'll go into uh, how Corona pretty much unfolded out here, you know, because it'll tie into what's going on. And uh, yeah. so when, when, when we got hit with the news, it was, we just got our bulldog, too. The last thing we were expecting was a, was a pandemic, you know? So we got this new dog and... Two weeks later, they're like, hey, everybody stay indoors, you know? And uh, it sucked because a lot of the expats out here, everyone, uh, majority of them are, are teachers. And the, the schools closed down because of COVID. Yeah. So uh, my girlfriend and her whole family were pretty much out of work for, for two months. And uh, thankfully, her and I were still able to get salaries from our jobs. And uh, then we all moved together. So when Corona happened... The, gov the Vietnamese government really acted fast, and they acted great when it came to, to, to containing uh, corona, and they shut down pretty much all non-essential businesses. And they shut down, you know, uh, all the restaurants, the hotels, the spas, you know. Starbucks was still open, though, because, you know, coffee is an essential. Well, and, sure. uh, yeah, and I was like, I was driving by, I was like, really? Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> and, and uh so grocery stores were open, uh, restaurants were allowed to stay open, but only if they did delivery only. So that's where that starts tying in with the craft beer. What Rooster did, we really focused and uh, dialed in on just our canned products. You know, so we took we took our IPA, the pale ale, the blonde. You know what? I'm gonna help. Shh, don't tell anybody. I yeah. think my boss is watching. Don't tell him though. Okay. I'm. Uh, I'm. I'm already on two. So, by the way, we'll pause real quick. So, um, cheers, uh, by the way. I actually just poured. So, I don't know. you. I, I For sure, you guys have not had it out there. So, this is Energy City. This is uh, uh, one of the newer breweries uh, here in Batavia. Uh, okay. So, I just poured their uh, their parfait, their Bistro Grand Raspberry Blueberry Blackberry Parfait. Uh, and sure. earlier when we, uh, we logged on, yeah, they dump a ton of fruit in there. And they're fantastic. Yeah. They're all out outrageously good. 
Uh, and earlier, we're actually going to be talking to these guys next week with 93 Octane Brewery over here in St. Charles. They're a cool. blood orange easy IPA called Joyride. Uh, so Ooh. those are my two beers for tonight. What, uh, what before we go back to coronavirus? What yeah. uh, what did you just pour in your in your mug? Uh, I'm taking it out of the can. The, the uh, right out of the IPA. can. The IPA. Yeah. yeah, the Rooster IPA. I love this. I took a I took a whole case from the brewery the other day. <laughs> <laughs> You know the the one cool uh, the one cool thing I really love about our cans. You know, I got the pale ale right here too. Um, yeah, we really our brand is very color orientated when it comes to our branding. And, yeah. Uh, IPA is green. The can for the pale is red. Blonde is yellow, and uh, the dark is dark. And, yeah. Uh, I love how we get to use the whole can, like the whole real estate of the can. You know, you mm -hmm. got you got everything from the top all the way down to the bottom. Cans, yeah. I love cans, but out here in Vietnam, going back to not the craft beer scene not really being known, um, cans are still kind of perceived as cheap and not good. Does that make sense? You know, yeah. that, that old school way of thinking. Um, bottles means it's expensive and it's got to be good. It's uh, yeah. luxury, which I get it. Cool, whatever. But um, I personally love cans. Keeps the beer fresh for longer. And you get to have a lot more fun with the cans, you know. So, and I love going back home and just you, you don't get to see like those big tall boys like you have back there anymore out here. Oh, you know? I know, you I know. You don't, you don't see those. You don't get those out here. Uh, I mean, Birvana imports Stone and Rogue, so once in a great while, you you get that. But other than that, um, yeah, not that much. So, but yeah, I'm drinking the Rooster Rapier. <laughs> Um, real quick before we go back to the how you know how coronavirus is kind of affected, and then we'll move on. Um, our good friend Mark Augustine, uh, good afternoon, Mark. Thanks for joining in again. Uh, he says, just curious, do you sell rooster beer in the Philippines? You guys actually you distribute outside of of kind of like your low you, the little bubble of where you guys are located. Um, yeah. Where where else do you guys do you guys distribute to? Obviously not here in the in the, in the states, but. Um, Mark wants to know, uh, do you guys uh, sell beer, rooster beer in the Philippines? No, not yet. So um, I'll talk about that a little bit later on when it comes to distribution and whatnot. Um, yeah. But not yet in the Philippines. I would love to be in the Philippines. I love the Philippines. It's great. I was just in the Philippines last March. Yeah, last March uh, watching uh, Slayer's Farewell Tour. I love it out there. It was great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, was a, it was a great time, man. It was a lot of fun. You know, but... To answer that plain and simple, no, not at, not at this time. Not not yet. Yeah. Go to um, Singapore. Go to Singapore. Go to, go to yeah. Singapore. Yeah. So Corona has kind of, you know, here here in the States, uh, we'll kind of finish up with this. Here in the States, has, it's basically shut everything down. You know, yeah. schools are shut down. I mean, you, you still talk to your family out here. You still have friends and family out here. You, you know what yeah. basically is going on. Uh how you know, and we had spoke earlier with uh, with you and your girlfriend before she before she left for work. Um yeah. things were shut down, but you guys kind of took the reins and took control of it right away. And, you know, now things are starting to get back to normal. How did it, what, what did you guys in the craft beer industry, how did that affect you guys? Uh, it affected everybody very, and it affected everybody differently. At Rooster, we really uh, focused on doing the canning line, you know, getting uh, stopped really doing production on kegs because the bars were closed. You know, there was only, there was only a few bars that was doing kind of like a speakeasy type of thing, you know? Yeah. And, uh, uh, that was great, but we really focused on doing cans and getting our product into cans. And then every other brewery that was canning or bottling, and people that weren't were asking breweries, "Hey, could I grab all your canning machine for a day?" Which is kind of hard, but you know. And um, then we really focused on going to off-market trade. So off-market trade is convenience stores, grocery stores, um, places that aren't on trade, which is like restaurants you know, and bars. Sure. So we hit, we hit up the online services. Uh, we don't, curbside is definitely a state side uh, uh, term. Um, curbside right. out here is, I mean, curbside out here is me going up and getting a banh mi, which is a sandwich on my, on my scooter. Yeah. You know, I just drive up. Oh, I'm a food guy. A oh, I know yeah. what a banh mi is. <laughs> <laughs> For those that you don't, you know, but uh, the yeah. curbside out here, uh, you know, I mean, you can definitely get curbside beer if you want to, but uh, everyone uses online services out here. So you got this place called Beer Fridge, uh, which sells everything. It's great. 
So we hit up places like that, convenience stores, mom, pa convenience stores. Uh, there's this one little convenience store down the block called Tomato, and it's just owned by this Vietnamese girl and her boyfriend. It's really cool. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, and then uh, I love the name Tomato. It's great. And then Tomato. you know, yeah, corporate stores like we're we're hitting up. We'll we'll be in Circle K soon. Circle K back in the states, a lot of it is gas stations. Out here, Circle yeah. K are like Seven Elevens. So oh yeah, yeah for yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah. So we have Circle K, Seven Eleven, K Market, which is Korean Market, and uh, uh, um, a few other uh, different convenience stores. We're working on getting into those. Uh, and during Corona, we really focused on putting our effort to getting into those, you know, sure. um, and a lot of it was communicating to to the consumer that we have cans, we have beer for you. You know, right. we want we want to be your everyday beer in your fridge. You know? Right. And that's what we did. You know, and we saw a lot of other breweries focusing in and doing that as well, you know, really hammering, getting it through to people that look. Um, you can still get beer and you can still get good beer even yeah. if you're stuck in them. What the fuck else are you going to do in isolation? Come on, man. Right. Come on. You know, I, I drink so much. <laughs> you can only play so many video games until you get bored, you know? So, uh, um, I know exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, man. You know, but after Corona, post Corona, everyone's been doing pretty, pretty good. You know, our can sales have gone up just because of Corona, I guess you would say. Yeah. But, you know, Vietnam dodged a bullet when it came to Corona. Everything is pretty, yeah. pretty much back to normal out here. You know, we were getting, uh, it was mandatory to wear a mask. Um, I know there's sure. mixed feelings about that back home in the States, but it was mandatory yeah. out here. Um, and even pre-Corona, people were wearing face masks. We live close, sure. close quarters out here, you know, and you can buy face masks that kind of like look like a Bane mask and they have filters on the side for the pollution yeah. and you're driving your scooter around and everything. Yeah. Uh, so you can get stylish with it if you want to. And then, um, you know, after they lifted the ban, things started slowly opening one thing at a time. And now we're pretty much, I mean, I don't get my temperature checked anymore when I go grocery shopping or go to Starbucks to get a coffee, you know, so. Which is a good thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, we dodged a bullet out here, man. I'm, I'm happy where everybody's back to normal. Tap rooms are open. We had a big old craft beer fest at Saigon Outcast uh, to... a couple of weeks ago. So, you you did, yeah. And I actually I messaged you like in the middle of it. You sent me some pictures. Um, yeah. Before we get into the next question, tell me because it, it looked like it, it looked like there were quite a few vendors there, and and you actually mentioned some of the brewers. <clears throat> The head brewers from the, some from some of the other breweries, mm. like Doug and and like are are all are is the majority of like the the brew staff. I mean, obviously they're all probably owned by you know Vietnamese people, mm. but are they are the brewers primarily? You know, are they all expats or is it kind of like a mixed bag? So the the first wave of all the craft breweries were predominantly uh, Western owned, expat owned. You know, they were all expats because um, craft beer, craft beer was a, was a total Western. It's a total Western thing. You yeah. know, it's it's not really that big out here. Uh, and then the second wave, when Heart of Darkness, East West, uh, Winking Seal, Fur Brew uh, opened up, then you saw Vietnamese kids getting their hands, you know, getting their hands into the uh, into the pile. And that's when you saw Dom Sun come up. Uh, 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 and a few others that have folded now, but one of the new ones that I really like is called Deme, Deme Brewing, D-E-N-E, -E, Deme. Really cool, but they're 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 definitely what we call the young Buffalo crowd out here, which is like the younger, like yeah. you know, eighteen to twenty-four year old uh, underground skater, uh, hip hop type of thing. Yeah. You know, they're great, but they make some cool beer. But you're starting to see more Vietnamese owned uh, microbreweries out here. You know, you're starting to see them actually take a leap of faith in a sense and say, sure. all right, some of them have worked for other breweries, you know, you know, we yeah. have we, one of our old staff worked for another brewery out here, you know, uh, so it's it's pretty cool. But the brew masters, majority of them are expats. I believe C uh, Brewmaster, he is Vietnamese, um, uh, but head brewers. I don't know at the. I can't name any off the top of my head except for the uh, Kung from Seabird Master. 
What's the legal drinking age in Vietnam? Uh, 18, I believe. 18? Oh, God, I wish. Oh. Yeah, I know. Well, no. you're, you're, you're turning 21 today on the podcast, right? So We're tra- Yeah, today's our 21st episode birthday. So, yeah, so cheers. Cheers, to, cheers to the Glass Less Travel turning 21 today. Yeah. We can finally... We're gonna finally legally drink. Um, oh wait, wait, I got, I got, a, I got something really funny, really quick. You know about the legal yeah. drinking age? Uh, yeah. When I first moved out here, I was sitting outside of the restaurant, and uh, I saw this, I saw this little kid come out with a bag full of Tiger, Tiger beers. <laughs> yeah. And I looked at, I looked at my, uh, my boss's wife, uh, who was my boss at the time. I looked at her, I was like, "What is that little kid doing with like a twelve pack of beer in that bag?" And she's like, "He just buy for his dad." And I was like. Just bought for his dad. Perfectly fine. And she's like, yeah, why not? And I was like, that's what I'm fucking talking about. Come on, America. Get your shit together. Come on, man. <laughs> all behind America. Come on. Yeah. Go get me a 12-pack and a pack of cigarettes, boy. Yeah. You know? so. <laughs> uh, um, we're, uh, we're, we're starting to see more distilleries and, and wineries and, and dis, um, you know, kind of and, and breweries even. Um, mm-hmm. Speak more of terroir when advertising and marketing their products. Uh, terroir, for those of you who might not know, is a French term. It just basically means the landscape or the <laughs> land, the microclimate of of where you know your distillery or brewery or winery is located, where you grow the grain. Um, this helps when advertising the grain to glass movement, and we're uh, we are seeing in the craft industry. Vietnam has a climate that isn't quite like many growing areas when. Uh, where you would find things like hops, barley, which can make it difficult to be a grain-to-glass brewery. I'm curious to know where Rooster sources their grains from and how that relationship was built between the farmer and the brewery. Okay. Um, Grain-to-glass isn't really a thing out here, you know. Um, Being a chef, I remember this this new fad of, you know, farm-to-table. And honestly, when I read your question... That was the first time I heard about grain to glass. I was like, the fuck is this? And I was like, is this a farm yeah. table type of thing? You know, and we did a little research. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Pizza and uh, sip is the other one. Yeah. And I was like, okay, you know, we don't do grain to glass, but there are a lot of breweries out here that will go to local farmers, especially coffee farmers. Coffee is one of the biggest exports in Vietnam. So, I mean, when we made a coffee porter back in the day, we worked with some brewery, uh, um, brewery um, coffee farmer somewhere in the in the northern part of, of Vietnam. Uh, but there's breweries out here. Fur Brew just released a, a coffee beer that they work really close with uh, some of the local farmers. So you will get breweries that don't do grain to glass, but farm to glass maybe, <laughs> you know, um, when it comes to different sure. fruits and different uh, components that they can use. So that, that we got out here. Um, when it comes to grain, Vietnam's a very, the, the, the climate out here isn't ideal for, for hops and for grains and all that stuff, you know? It's a right. very volatile climate. And um, like it's rainy, like I was telling you earlier, it's, it's rainy season out here. It's gonna be raining for the next, uh, now like what, three months, four months? And um, yeah, that sucks for crops. <laughs> um, yeah. But we personally, there's a, there's a, a huge malt uh, company out here called Intermalt. And I went to their grand opening a few years ago. Impressive, fucking huge, amazing, really, really yeah. good. And they supply like the really big brands like Heineken, Tiger, and Budweiser. But um, when it comes to us, we use a few base malts from them. But what we import, we import from Germany, from Belgium, from Czech. You know, like Doug the other day when I was talking to him about imports and whatnot, he was like, "Why would I import, uh, or why would I use some kind of?" grain that you know i get from somebody out here for a czech style pilsner when i can just import that grain from the czech right get a check get a check uh, uh pilsner so we we've developed over the years this uh relationship with some of the different grain suppliers throughout the world you know and uh it's been great you know it's um luckily here it's easy for us to to get in and out with imports and exports uh, right. Philippines, I know, struggle a little bit with that. Um, it sucks. It's hard for them. But out here, you know, we import our hops from Yakima Chief as well. I love Yakima Chief. I want to I wanna visit Yakima Chief. Shout out to Yakima Chief. You guys fucking do amazing. I love Yakima Chief, man. They're great. Um, all the hops they supply us, is, I, I love it. Um, 
if any people that are interested in making beer use Yakima Chief, Yakima Chief is dope. Um, but, you know, other than that, it's great in the glass isn't really a thing out here, man. Not yet, at least. Not yet. Yeah. Give, it, give, it, give it a little bit more time and maybe one of the breweries are going to do it soon, you know, if possible. Vietnam is is kind of is is very much like still an, a a very agrarian culture, you know. Yeah. It's every you know it's it's farmers everywhere. Have you have you seen any you know like I had mentioned you know I've got uh, Energy City right behind me and they do a lot of really cool stuff with like post fermentation where they're, where they'll dump a bunch of fruit in and it you know it, yeah. you know they use all these different adjuncts. You had mentioned that you know in Vietnam it's they're still very traditional you know lagers and. You know, half of Eisen's and Pilsner and, and and that, with the kind of interesting fruits and all the the things that you guys have in in Vietnam that we don't have here in the states. Do you think it's possible that maybe one of the breweries is is going to say like, hey, you know what? Let's do some like, let's throw this adjunct in there. You know, this fruit that only grows here, you know, in Vietnam, or this grain that only grows here in Vietnam. Do you see any of that happening anytime soon, or are you guys still? It already happens. They they already do it. People are using lychees. People are using star fruits. Um, uh, there was one brewery I forgot who did it, but they were using uh, they use black garlic. I mean, you can get black garlic back home in the states, but Ooh. nobody ever really uses it. Uh, they, yeah, I know black garlic in a beer was really weird, but yeah, you yeah. know that's pushing the limits of craft, right? Uh, right. So people already do that, definitely out here. Um, people make a dragon fruit IPA. I think it's Winking Seal makes a dragon fruit IPA. Uh, at one point in time, Lincoln Seal tried doing a durian. If you guys don't know what durian oh, is, I know. I know what a durian is. It smells like uh, it smells like if like an onion were to rot inside of a dirty sock. <laughs> I love durian, man. Durian's yeah. great. Some, Sometimes I don't some like, smell, like it, but it's good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> some yeah. people like it's it. It's like cilantro, you know. Yeah, and uh, yeah, right. <laughs> but you know, Winking Seal did a durian coffee beer, which was really out there. It, was, it wasn't bad, and. Um, yeah. But yeah, people are definitely pushing the limits when it comes to using local ingredients, sure. like especially fruits. Yeah, you know, we don't personally rooster. We don't add, we don't put additives, adjuncts, chemical enhancers, anything in our beer. Uh, so when you taste the fruitiness from us, that's you know, it's brewing science. It's coming from right. the hops. It's coming from the grains, the water, so on and so forth. So, yeah. sure. Um, Spencer Lent, uh, which was one of the, one of the folks. That that wanted that had some questions. Um, he says uh, distribution for any sort of craft beer can be a difficult and costly venture. We often see many craft breweries sell their product out of the brewery or offer limited amounts to sell at local liquor stores. I'm curious to know your thoughts on distribution for Vietnamese beers like Rooster outside of Vietnam. Do you think we'll see Rooster or any other Southeast Asian beers on the shelves at liquor stores here in the States or maybe just here in the Chicagoland area? So Rooster, we're we're really focused on domestic uh, domestic sales and distribution. You know, we 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 do distribute to Singapore right now. My buddy Anad uh, over at Beer Porters in Singapore. I know he's watching. What's up, man? Um, he he imports our beer over to Singapore uh, every few months. He's ordering whatnot. Um, but international distribution isn't really our thing. We're not right. aimed for that yet. We're there's so much to conquer here already, man. You know, that's, yeah, we're more worried about the domestic market. Um, sure. But would we like to do international distribution? Fuck yeah. Who doesn't? You know, that's, I can't, I can't wait to come back home in Chicago and just grab one of our beers from, from, from the fridge, you know, from the local liquor store. Yeah. And hopefully we'll get to that point maybe in the next three to five years, you know, depending on what it is. So yeah. uh, international distribution for, for Rooster, not really, but the good news for you crafties out there is that there are breweries like Heart of Darkness and Pastor Street Brewing that do international distribution. You know, uh, I think I saw someone comments uh, on the thing that said they had a cyclo stout from Pastor Street, which on their shelf, I'm not sure if they meant at their house or at their, their liquor store, but <laughs> hit up that guy and, and, and go grab that. You know, it's probably going to be really expensive, but other than that, <laughs> Um, other than that, Heart of Darkness and uh, uh, I know uh, the guys at Heart of Darkness, the, the tapper manager is one of my good friends, and um, they're they're all about that international distribution, man. They they you know that's their game, you know, and that's what they do. So they're on yeah. that side, we're on this side, you know, so it's great. So I would say you could um, potentially, I think, Heart of Darkness 
would be maybe the one brewery that would make it stateside anytime soon <laughs> from from this part of the world from this part of from the this world. yeah from 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 where yeah. you guys are at yeah. um in in the u.s we're seeing a growing interest in unique styles of beer that include adjuncts like uh, like fruit and vanilla like we talked about uh coffee and many others we also see a huge interest in bourbon barrel aging uh, from breweries like Goose Island, who have popularized their Bourbon County Stout as well as Surly Brewing uh, and their Darkness Imperial Stout, both of which um, have something of a cult following uh, in their respective yes. rights. If they haven't already, do you see these kinds of trends like the barrel aging and the stouts, you know, that kind of thing? Do you see that kind of trend making its way to the palate of the consumer in Vietnam? Slowly. There's been, uh, there's already been a few breweries that have been dabbling in the barrel aging. Uh, mm -hmm. East West, East West did it and it was, uh, theirs was fucking great. It was really good. Um, I was spoiled because my roommate and one of my best friends, Maddie, was the head chef there at East West Brewing. So I was able to, uh, I was always able to go in there and get some beers with him and hang out and whatnot. But um, uh, you're starting to see some of the breweries and it's tap rooms only you know, where they release these barrel ages. Um, and you get this rotation of, excuse me, you get this rotation of, of, of beers coming in and out like the style. So for a couple of months, it'll be sours and lambics, you know, it'll be mm -hmm. really fruit, fruity sours uh, for a month or two. And next thing you know, nitro stouts are all the rage. Next thing you know, triple IPAs are the rage. Um, it's, it's always fluctuating. Um, but when it comes to the local right. taste, it's still, I mean, craft in general so far, far off away from hitting the local market. So that yeah. included even more, <laughs> even further away. Um, but there are places like Rehab Station that really introduce those, those technical styles, those real crafty craft styles of craft beer to mm -hmm. the local demographic. But it is pricier. It's very you know it's it's very pricey compared so i had the uh, uh you might know this one salted caramel bourbon something from uh anderson valley i think it was like a salted okay. caramel bourbon bourbon aged stout it was well that amazing. sounds fantastic oh my god <laughs> it was so good it was amazing it was so good but it was two hundred and fifty thousand vietnam dong for just can of it, yeah. which is 250,000 is, I don't know, uh, off the top of my head, that's like 15, that's like 15 US dollars from one can. Yeah. So to the local, that's like, why the fuck would I spend that? You know? Yeah. And even I was saying like, what the hell am I spending this right now? But I, <laughs> I, I miss those tastes, you know, I miss, I miss that, that, that specialty beer. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I think in the in the long future we'll definitely see more of it. But for short term and what's happening in front of us right now, you only get it once in a great while, man. Pastry yeah. stouts, like earlier when you said pastry stouts, that that parfait one that you're drinking, yeah, the first time I heard about a par parfait beer. <laughs> like, <laughs> Energy City oh. is doing some really, really just crazy, just off the wall kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, we're and gonna have a very fun time when I come back to Chicago. Yeah, we yeah we definitely will because <laughs> literally our fridge is between. Between Energy City and all the other places that are around here, it's it, like we have a little mini fridge and it's like yeah. stuffed full. And I, I I can't go to enough bottle shares because I can't share it fast enough <laughs> with the pace that I'm like bringing it in. Yeah, yeah. Um, Nick uh, Nick Ford wants, and it's I know, and like everywhere I go, I'm like, oh man, that one sounds really like I'm a bourbon guy. I love bourbon, so I'll go get bourbon or whiskey or wherever or whatever. Yeah. But I I've, I've never really been big into beer. I'm starting to get into it a little bit. Um, so I try a lot of it, you know, and then of course my yeah. wife, Dina, she likes to try it all too. So, you know, anywhere we go, she's like, Oh, this one sounds good. Let's get this one. Um, <laughs> Nick Ford wants to also pops up as Facebook user on screen. Mm -hmm. uh, I went to Facebook. This is Nick Ford. Uh, this okay. is the sales manager for 93 octane, uh, 93 octane. We're talking to them next week. That's this one uh, that cool. I finished earlier. Um, he wants to know, uh, they actually are releasing a beer, which again, we'll talk about next week. Um, that was aged in um, old elk uh, in 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 a in, in a bourbon barrel. I think yeah. it was I think it was old elk. Um, so here it's it's a lot of aging in bourbon barrels. In mm. 
when when we talk about barrel aging in you know in Southeast Asia, just kind of in general, um, <coughs> wants to know are there more Japanese whiskey barrels on hand in Vietnam? Which I would, I I, I don't know how that would. I honestly don't know. Um, I forget what brewery was using. They were trying to use uh, some sake, something to do with sake. Was it was it like the the yeast strain something they were doing something but honestly i don't know i know there was a handful of people going around vietnam finding old barrel aged like rice wine you know stuff like yeah. that but uh japanese though i don't think so sorry man be, i wish i had it be, better it, it, would, it would certainly be an interesting beer to buy japanese japanese whiskey is very much like uh yeah. like very very smooth or very soft yes. like scotch yeah. There's a uh, there's a really cool bar called Whiskey and Wares out here. Well, whiskey bar called Whiskey and Wares, and that was one of my first times. Uh, our brewer Doug took me there, and he's like, "You don't know anything about whiskey. Let me show you what's up." And we went there, and I had I think it started with an H, like Vicky or something like that, uh, a Japanese whiskey, and it was, it was fucking amazing. So good. There's uh there there's so many different Japanese whiskey, and I'm more of a bourbon guy. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not very well versed in the Japanese whiskey. A lot of them are just hard for me as an American to pronounce. Um, so I don't, I, uh, I, I, I try not to, I don't, Japanese whiskey just isn't really my thing. You know, it's yeah. like scotch. I, I'm more of a, I'm more of the, of the bourbon guy. It'll be yeah. interesting to see that. I'm sure you'll, you're interested to kind of see where this kind of bourbon barrel or this barrel aging just in general kind of takes off in, uh, in Vietnam. Um, yeah. Rodolfo wants to know, uh, he said, uh, we, we mentioned, uh, the climate in Vietnam and how it differs uh, from here in the States. Does yeah. the hot weather in Vietnam discourage stout production? Uh, yeah. You know, um, the milk stout, we make a milk stout and I love our milk stout, but you don't see a lot of stouts because it's so hot. You know, the dark beer that we make is a Mexican style dunkle and we, we have the number one selling dark in Vietnam. If anyone says different, I mean, they can come fight me. <laughs> <You know>? but, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, it's a light, easy drinking dark beer. So when you talk about stouts and porters and that, that style and that uh, type of what's going on, um, yeah, it's not really that popular. When you go up north, when you go to Dalat and Hanoi, uh, where it gets a little bit colder, you go up into the mountains, um, yeah, definitely. You know, you, you'll see a lot more people drinking the heavier style beers. Um, my my favorite memory about back home drinking uh, stouts, it was a founder stout and was going home during the winter and opening up the window and doing some cleaning around the house on a nice winter day, drinking a stout, you know, like, but you don't, I, I open up the windows here and it's like 95 degrees. The last thing I want to do is <laughs> drink a real heavy beer. Right. So, yeah. Yeah, you don't really see that too many, too many uh, stouts being produced out here. Um, well, so we 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 kind of talked about the you know the the whole beer scene, and and Mary Mary Tosh uh, asked it, it was it was it Hibiki, the one that you drank? Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, that was Hibiki. That one is a popular one. That one I actually have behind me. That's one of the only Japanese. Yeah, see, uh, that one's good. That, I like that. that I like. That one's real good. Yeah, yeah I, I, I do, uh, I do enjoy that one. Um, yes. Let's see here. Hold on. Let me go back here. There we go. Um, <coughs> Vietnam has become increasingly popular as an expat destination in recent years, uh, and is now recognized as a safe place for foreigners to live and work. Expats yeah. are attracted by the nice weather, the low cost of living, the lively culture, and the steady improvements in Vietnam's infrastructure. Something like 100,000 expats call Vietnam home. Has the expat community in Vietnam made it easier for you to adjust living outside of the United States? Yes and no. <laughs> it's uh, kind of a complicated. Uh, so when I first moved out here, I was a chef back home in Chicago. I was just finishing up one of my first head chef gigs. I went back to go work with my uh, my mentor, my chef mentor, uh, um, uh, Chef Casada. And you know, when I told him I wanted to move to Vietnam, he was like, "Fucking do it, man." He's like, "Go." He's like, "You've never been anywhere outside of America either, so have some fun. Dive in, dive into the food, into the culture, and really, and really enjoy it." So moving out here <clears throat> was really culture shock, and made me realize how good of a how good of a, 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 a an area we live in that part of the world. You know, we have we live in a bubble in America, 
And it was great. Don't get me wrong. It's amazing. I love back home. <clears throat> but moving out here really put a lot of everything in perspective for what we have back in, back in the States. And, um, you know, moving out here and, and just driving on a scooter right away where, you know, I can touch elbow to elbow with the person next to me. You know, you don't, you don't get that type of stuff. So um, when it comes to the expat style of living out here, are there things that made it easier? Mm, yeah, I guess, like McDonald's and Burger King, uh, you know, getting some food that I miss. But not that much. You you know, in Vietnam, the development of Vietnam is so intense. It's crazy. You have so many different countries in here making developments. Like uh, the apartment complex that we live in is uh, Capital Land, which I believe is Singaporean. And then you have Nova Land, which is, uh, I forget which one, but you have Korean uh, developers, you have Japanese developers, Chinese developers, American, English, Australian. So you kind of get this melting pot of what we have back home in Chicago too, of all these different cultures coming together. And you you really get to see a lot of different uh, expat way of living and whatnot. Um, but personally, mm -hmm. I don't really hang out too much in the expat community. Um, I hang out more with a lot of more locals. Uh, I think the most expats sure. I hang out with is my girlfriend's family and like a few of my friends, you know. But other than that, I'm, yeah. I'm going I'm going and eating um, snails on the side of the road with a friend or two, you know, uh, practicing yeah. my broken Vietnamese, you know, while they practice their, <laughs> their English with me, you know, it's a trade off. But um, I kind of just forge my own way when moving out here and learn. Yeah. You know, I was just like, I'm not back home. I came out here with the mentality of that. I want to start a new life. I want to work. I want to make something of myself. And Rooster gave me that opportunity. You know, uh, at sure. one point in time, Mike and his wife, Mike, sat me down. Uh, and they're like, do you want to move back home? And I was like, no, I want to work for you guys. Is that cool? And they're like, really? You want to <laughs> stay here? And I was like, fuck yeah. This is really cool. You know, and then I started working with them in the bars and really uh, – uh, dove into the deep end when it came to living out here in Vietnam and getting used to the culture, you know? Yeah. When, uh, so when we're, we're, uh, we're just past the hour now. Um, mm. there's, uh, there's always one question that, that I leave off. I send all of the interviewees the questions ahead of time so they can review them. So we know about the talking points. There's always one question that I leave off just so there's some little bit of surprise. Uh, and this one, Don is really more, more about you. Um, as much as I love learning about the craft industry, whether it be distilling or brewing, what really interests me more are the people in that industry. Um, this is certainly a cool experience getting to speak to you and learn not only about Rooster Beers, but about the American who became their brand ambassador. I'm curious about what it is about Vietnam that made you fall in love with the country and what made you stay to call it home? Um, what made me fall in love with the country? Man, um... Uh... The, the, the hard work, everyone out here just works so hard, you know, uh, the entrepreneurship that everyone has as well. I mean, if you wanted to come out here, we can open up a bar tomorrow if you wanted to, you know, we just got to get a Vietnamese partner. But, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I really just fell in love with it because of the freedoms that you get out here. There's a lot of freedoms that you get out here that you don't get back home and vice versa, totally vice versa too, yeah. you know, but, um, you know, and just... It, in a sense, it felt like a weight was lifted off my chest and off my shoulders because I wasn't stuck in the rat race back home, you know, clocking in, clocking out, um, sitting in it. I've worked in kitchens for nine years, you know, with my buddies, Billy and Inti, you know, and just we would look out the window and go like, oh, one of these days, I swear, one of these days I'll be out there on that side. you know. And yeah. after I got it, after I got a taste of that, I wanted more, you know, and then Mike, uh, the founder CEO of Rooster, he started giving me more responsibilities and more responsibilities led. I started cleaning beer lines with, with this company. Even before that, I was standing outside with a menu, holding it out to people. Hey, Vietnamese food, craft beer, craft beer, Vietnamese food. You know, people are walking by, they're like, you speak in English? I'm like, what the fuck does it look like? Of course I am, you know? Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> Do I look Vietnamese? <laughs> yeah. And, uh, <laughs> You know, so I really did start from from the bottom up, and I proved myself to to Mike and Mai and the Brook and everybody the higher ups at, at Rooster to to get where I'm at. You know, I've been given the opportunity, and I wasn't going to let it go to waste. I was going to work my ass off, and 
I mean, I still do work my ass off. Uh, many hango, many, many hangovers later, here we are, you know, and, uh, but I love it out here. Uh, I do miss back home, but I don't see myself moving back home anytime soon. Yeah. And, uh, this place is home. You know, I plan on staying out here for a while. Uh, so does my girlfriend. Um, you know, we plan on visiting South Africa sometime soon. Yeah. But, uh, what made me fall in love with it was just the freedom I, that I got that I didn't have back home. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I know a lot of people like, you know, they, they visit Vietnam. It's, it's the culture, it's the, it's the atmosphere, it's the food. It's, you know, it, it's just, it's different from here in the States. Mm. You know, and, and we have, uh, you know, we have a large Vietnamese culture here. Uh, one of our good friends, a uh, mutual friend, uh, Tiffany. Um, yeah. You know, we she was throw... like my only Vietnamese friend growing up, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's up, Tiffany? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure she'll. I'm sure her and uh, I'm sure her and Ed will watch this later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I I would. Uh, you know, like I said, you and I had 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 talked, and 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 uh, Dina and your girlfriend got on, and and uh, it it what I see and what I read and what I see on TV and what I read about in articles and, you know, you see the pictures and yeah, there's, you know, there, there's, there's bad sides and there's good sides. You know, there's, there's mm. parts of Vietnam that might not be so good. There's parts that are absolutely fantastic. You have that literally everywhere in the world, you yeah. know, any place you go to in the world. And, and, you know, exactly. with some place like that, that's just the food, the culture, the, you know, the, the, the ambiance, the atmosphere, just kind of getting away from everything. It just seems very lively. And, and it seems like a really cool place to visit. I already told you, um, I will gladly sleep on, sleep on the couch. Uh, <laughs> if, we, if we come to visit, um, I would, uh, I would to, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll do like a little food tour. You and I are foodies. So we'll do a little, yeah. <laughs> a little food road tour. Yeah. Um, Don, I want to thank you so much for joining, uh, for joining us and start starting your day with a great beer and hopefully a <laughs> cup of coffee. Um, oh, yeah. This has certainly been a great experience and it was so good to meet you and, and learn about rooster beer. Um, I think oh, yeah. I speak for everyone that watched tonight when I say, whether it be beer or whiskey, these things tend to bring us together and open our minds to new things, new experiences and new cultures. Um, it's been a pleasure to speak with you uh, this evening and learn about a new culture. Uh, you guys can find rooster beer on social media at rooster beers. Uh, if you're ever in Vietnam, make sure to check them out and meet the great people at the brewery and make sure to ask for Don to be your tour guide. Um, Don, before we uh, before we log off and I go to my third beer, uh, do you have anything else before uh, before you start your day and I end mine? I'm going to go take a nap probably. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, nah, man, you know, just uh, everybody, everybody just be nice to each other. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and drink some and drink some good beer, you know, have fun. <laughs> Drink some good beer and be nice to each other, man. You know, I like that. It. I like again, it. And once, uh, once, uh, once the whole uh, international traveling thing is open again, please, uh, everybody, come visit. You know, come visit. Yeah. Um, I want to thank everyone who watched tonight and spent some time with us. Uh, remember to click like and sub the like and subscribe button for new videos, uh, reviews, and interviews every week. Check out our podcast on whatever platform you listen to podcasts on. We will be back next Wednesday with 93 Octane Brewing in St. Charles um, to talk about local beer. And on August 5th, we will be chatting with the 2020 recipient of the American Distilling Institute's Distillery of the Year, Spirit Works Distilling out of Sonoma County, California. Uh, Don, go take a nap. Everybody out there, cheers. <laughs> and we will see you guys. Uh, we will see you guys next week.